Hello everyone, we are back for Dragon Talk, recording live on the Twitches. How are you? Did you enjoy those last two interviews on the Twitch chats? Uh, I see you guys talking, we're actually able to uh, watch some ads, huh? What's that like? Do you like being advertised to? If you don't like it, you know what you can do? You can subscribe to the Twitch channel. I know I saw a bunch of you did. Uh, earlier on in this here stream, but there hasn't been a, a bunch for a while. So uh, get, get on it. That's right. Get in there. Because I, I mean, I'm like the kind of guy who I, I'll pay the extra four bucks on Hulu just so I don't have to watch ads. It's like the greatest thing in the world. Have you seen that uh, Sarah Silverman show on there by any chance? I have not, no. It's, it, it's good. Huh. But I like that she actually specifically called out that. She's like, well, and if you're paying the extra four bucks, you won't. It'll just fade to black and we'll fade right back up and it'll be great. I'm like, oh, she's talking to me. I'm the person that is that way. Uh, and uh, Lauren Obo Crazy says she's always happy to see Mr. Cerna at the table. Oh, hey, yay. Yay. Hey. Uh, how are you doing, Lauren? It's good to see you. Yeah, last week. Um, and uh, Lauren gave me some amazing uh, candies from her. What's the name of that box called that she had? The, not the tackle box. It has a specific name. It was kickstarted. I don't know. You know, it's a, it's a cool. Oh, she'll tell me here and there. Uh, but yes, we're going to talk about the Shadowfell and Lycanthropes, not Jez. You have two favorite things, and those are of your two favorite things. Well, that's good. We're, we're, we're checking them off the list right about now. Uh, so which one do you want to do first? Did you want to do Shadowfell first? Sure, yeah. Let's All do right. it. Let's do it. Are you guys ready on the recordings over there? Good. Yes, Moreland West, you can also mute the ads. Thank you for telling us that. <laughs> you have broken the internet. Uh, you can also go away to a different tab uh, and uh, pay attention to something else and then come back when the, and then the advertisement. Don't go away. Don't go away, though. You want us to always be front and center on your browsers or something like that. But, you know, hey, I'm you, Moreland West. Moreland West? That's a good name, Moreland West. All right, I'm, I'm dithering. Welcome to another episode. Episode. Welcome to Lore You Should Know. The segment where we take little bits of Dungeons and Dragons lore, take them out on a shelf, bang them with a hammer, talk about them, and uh, let them into the small pieces that you can infect into your own campaign as, uh, you know, based on the Forgotten Realms or just based on Dungeons and Dragons in general. Uh, and I am joined by... Hello, I'm Matt Surratt. Hi, Matt. How are you doing? Pretty good. No Chris Perkins today because he's recovering from... The things happening this weekend. I'm not sure. I, don't, I have no idea. Yeah, uh, but he is here in spirit. Uh, in fact, he's wearing the socks uh, that are on display here in front of us. There are socks. There are socks. Isn't that cool? Uh, but today we're going to talk about the Shadowfell and or the upside down and or that idea of another shadowy version of our realm uh, and how that has ties to old school Dungeons and Dragons as well as folklore as well as uh, Stranger Things uh, season one at the very least. Um, because we got season two coming very soon, uh, and we thought we might have some some questions about all that. We have not seen season two, so we don't know exactly what's in it or not. Uh, but just kind of based on what's going on in the uh, in the story of the of the to be continued and all the trailers that we've seen, it looks like they're going to explore some of those ideas again. Yeah, so probably get back there a little bit. Yeah, find out what happened to Beth. It was Beth right? Beth or Barb? Barb. 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 Sorry. Yeah. Wait, no. Barb's dead. Uh, <laughs> wait, no. All Maybe. Right. Yeah. Uh, so those of you who don't know what we're talking about, Stranger Things is a show on Netflix. came out last year in the summertime, and there's a new season dropping very soon on the Netflix as well. Uh, so The Shadowfell uh, mm -hmm. wasn't always called The Shadowfell. Nope. No, it was originally The Plane of Shadow. 
So, uh, and I was just trying to figure out what kind of the first reference for it is, and um, I'm sure it was probably someplace else, but the one that I'm picking up right now is uh, the original first edition, Deities and Demigods, explains mm. the, the Plane of Shadow. And it explains it as very much like it still is now. Um, a, a, it coexists with the Prime Material Plane, um, and it's sort of this this uh, result of the interaction between the positive and negative material planes with the material plane. And um, so there there was at one point in sort of opposition to the plane of shadow, a plane of radiance, I believe, that was um, a little different or entirely different. But positive energy plane, plane of radiance, these things have all gotten kind of conflated over time. But right. the plane of shadow is... Uh, sort of a, a different, darker place. Um, was it always like a complete, like a mirror version of the material world? Yeah, yes and no. I mean, it's a coexistent place, and uh, and so that that sort of has the the implication there. Um, but that idea kind of didn't really come to fruition. I don't think until um, more or less fourth edition. It was mm. kind of there in third for some things. Um, right, because there were a lot of shadow creatures yeah, in third. Yeah, that, the, the Nether, Nether East, we talked about them at a yeah. different time. They went to the Plane of Shadow for our time. Oh, right, right, right. Um, so the 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 idea of it being sort of a, a coexistent and a mirror plane um, really comes to the fore with the, the Feywild and so on in fourth edition where they became kind of on opposite sides of the material plane as opposed to sort of, you know, plane of radiance or positive energy or something like that. Right, right. Um, and the kids in the Stranger Things show, uh, they talk about the veil of shadow in a – it was a very uh, iconic moment for me where he's got this printed out article that had three hole punched in it and he was in a binder. Mm -hmm. um, and it looks like an article that you would find in, in the Dragon or Dungeon magazines of the 80s. Right, yeah. And as far as I know, that's that's made up for the show um, as opposed to something that was – It's apocryphal. Yeah. That, that's, that is, that's, that's, where, <laughs> that's the technical term for canon. it. Canon. Yeah, it is not canon. Uh, but it was close enough to ideas that were in Dungeons & Dragons that it felt very uh, real Yeah, in the storytelling. Yeah. And, you know, with with D&D &D and, and the Plane of Shadow, um, it, it was just kind of this – extra space where weird stuff came from, like Shadow Mastiffs and so on. Uh, and uh, like the original, I think it's Fiend Foley or Monster Manual 2 talks about the Plane of Shadow, and that I think came out after Deities and Demigods. I'd have to check to be sure. Right. Uh, and um, and then, again, second edition, there are some adventures from Planescape and so on that touch on it, um, setting boxes and so on that touch on it. But it's not really until, say, third edition where... Um, there was the reemergence of the Netherese that it kind of got more focus. And it was still called the Plane of Shadow then, not the Shadowfell. It wasn't okay. until 4th edition that it was renamed the Shadowfell. Um, what was the reasoning behind that? So I think there was just the the idea that um, Plane of blah, blah, blah was just in 2nd edition and 3rd edition was just kind of getting a little tired. Oh, okay. And so there was, a, and there was a whole reorganization of the whole cosmology with 4th edition where basically the Great Wheel cosmology with all of its, you know, various named planes and stuff like that kind of got chucked and it was replaced with uh, the 4th edition cosmology. And so... Uh, they a lot of places were renamed along with that mm -hmm. that effort. Um, there was sort of a, a sense that uh, the way that the planes were organized in second and third and first edition uh, was sort of um, too nonsensical and too sort of game based. Like it was, it was based on the alignments and the sort of shades of the alignment and all that kind of thing. That's the great wheel of all the different planes. Yeah. Uh, and then like there was the elemental plane of this, the para-elemental plane of this, the pseudo-elemental plane of this, and, and so, you know, it's, as soon as you get into, like, you know, the, the infinite planes of salt, <laughs> it starts to get a little silly. Oh, man, but being on the infinite plane of salt is terrible. You <laughs> yeah. get dry immediately. I was reading about that in the Planescape setting the other day. Yeah, so, you know, it, so, like, it got a bit silly, and so then I think that with 4th edition, as in many things in 4th edition, um, there was a bit of a, a over... Uh, correction for... Oh, I see. So, like, something you would get behind, but then you're like, okay, now you've gone too far. Yeah, it's it's yeah. the sacred cows have kind of... Uh, We've lost this, the sacred cows. Yeah. We made hamburger. We're eating them right now. <laughs> mm, delicious. Mm, um, well, we made the steak from the hamburger. Oh, I know. Yeah. This metaphor is going nowhere. Uh, so, the, with the shadow fell, uh, uh, and or, you know, the plane of shadow, uh, what were the, the defining features about it? That it was... That it was 
very much like ours, but tinted with with darkness. Yes, and that's the basic idea. Um, we're we're developing uh, more along those lines for a future product where we'll we'll get a bit more. Um, where we'll focus in on that a bit more. I'm I'm not really revealing any secrets. <laughs> <laughs> there are things in work. Yeah, in process. Well, so with with Volo's guide, there was sort of a sub theme of of Fae and the Fae Wild and how um, they're kind of like these emotional beings and stuff like that. And we're taking a similar tact uh, for a future product um, where, you know, the, the the idea essentially is that the Shadowfell is a place um, that in keeping with how uh, sort of Ravenloft is used and how um, we've put kind of Ravenloft in the realm of the Shadowfell with fourth edition and now sort of with fifth, that it's a place that traps people in negative emotions. Mm. So it doesn't heighten emotions like the Feywild. It traps you negative. So, so uh, Strahd is trapped in Ravenloft in this weird world that's sort of concocted just to keep him kind of in the stasis point of misery. Right. Um, and, and the way that w- it's like it's like a bubble within the Shadowfell. So it's it's right. It's not necessarily uh, uh, of the Shadowfell, but it's got the exact same properties within right. it and it's at its own little discrete world. And you know, it's it's protected by the mists of Ravenloft and so on and so forth. Right. Uh, and other elements of Ravenloft uh, for a long time, various settings in Ravenloft have had a similar idea where characters are kind of trapped there by these negative emotions. We talked I think with, uh, last time with about uh, Vecna and right. Kaas and that's a similar situation. Oh, okay. So we're taking, we're kind of like bringing that across the whole plane and making it into this place that sort of traps things and people with negative emotions. Now, c- similar to the plot of the first season of Stranger Things, you know, can something from the Shadowfell come to our plane or, or you know, the plane of the Forgotten Realms or wherever you're setting your, your can and, and pull things into it? Is that? Yeah, so um, there are, as with the Feywild, there are places, there are sort of border realms that are where the boundaries between the planes are weak. Oh, I see. And so things can kind of cross over. Uh, you know, in the um, the with the Feywild, it, you, you, it's associated with things like fairy rings or fairy mounds, or um, you know, maybe a particular phase of the moon, and you know, or you see a rainbow by this waterfall, and there's a gateway opens or something like that. Yeah. Um, with the Shadowfell, it might be more like uh, you know the plane or someone in it is actively opening up places where mm. people are miserable or there's a tragic story being told and so on and so forth and basically trapping people in the moment of their their misery I into see. the world. All so. right, people who are, uh, you know, if there's, you're right, so if there's a, a tragedy of something that's happened then that kind of yeah. creates a hole into the to the shadow fell or something like that. Right. Yeah. And I mean, the, the exact, like, you know, where it's weakest, like, uh, we've typically had it just sort of associated with dark places, but that's a bit weird because then it's like all of the underdark is... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right. If you close your closet, suddenly it's a doorway to the shadow field. No, it needs to be something that's emotionally resonant, you know. So but, things like like graveyards. Yeah. Things like that. Yeah, like can you know, be, sure. Yeah, right. Or uh, uh, bogs or swamps, that kind yeah, of thing. Or, or, or you, know, you know, maybe it's that um, that tree on the hill where people get hung all the time, right? right? You know, oh, and... Oh, that tree. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know that the maybe there's there's that that moment where, uh, you know they're they're about to whatever um, burn the murderer at the stake or something like that, and he's decrying all the townspeople about X, Y, and Z, and there's an eclipse, and all of a sudden he's gone, and he's he's off into the shadow fell, and he's doing his weird thing there. Interesting. So. All right, cool. Uh, do you do if you were going to set a campaign that was, you know, had had to deal with with these things, is that you know, I mean, we've already kind of done a few examples, but I feel like that's what you would do, right? Like, you yeah, yeah, and I, and I think it's, um, you know, we'll we'll see some some things as as we go that are more associated with the Shadowfell as as time goes on, and we'll see more examples. Um, I don't know that we'll we'll see something like Ravenloft anytime soon, but you never know. Um, what about a character that's like the uh, uh, like Eleven in Stranger Things that has somehow has a power both in, yeah, bo- in both worlds? There's there's lots of Options there in the the canon of the game. Um, there are creatures called um, uh, Shatter Kai, which are associated with the the, the Feywild, or not Feywild, the um, the Shadowfell. Uh, they have been, haven't been, depending upon the edition, treated in different ways, and so it's a, they're they're a little. Uh, um, it depends on what edition you look at, what they're like. Okay. Um, and then there's also uh, with the Netherese the idea of shades. Um, these are the people of Netheril who have lived there and mm-hmm. um, become sort of 
they're imbued with shadow stuff and shadow magic. Yeah. Um, and there's they uh, could have some kind of power. Yeah, there. and they they have um, sort of that that kind of uh, they have shadow related abilities and stuff like that. Um, what about like the uh, there's a subclass I think in Xanathar's Guide called the Horizon Walker. That's kind of like a uh, a, a ranger who is okay with traveling through the plains is that something that's that that's a really interesting idea i hadn't thought of that one that's a really creepy ranger yeah <laughs> right a ranger who's able to like oh that's his, yeah. his favorite ground is in the shadow fell that's that's ooh dark yeah <laughs> right and now i want to play as that as that character yeah, or like yeah. maybe one of your one of your player characters is that character and you learn you know slowly over time that he actually had or she actually has power yeah and I, I mean if you want to play a character that that um, sort of has that dark side or or has that dark backstory or something like that I think the Shadowfell is a great way to kind of build up that idea you know there's the idea in, in mythology of changelings you know in the sense of um, you know the in the in the case of most mythology, it's uh, it's like an elf realm or something like fairies or something like that. I've replaced your child with a changeling, right? Um, and you know, with the Feywild, you know, maybe it is like, uh, you know, are you a, a Kal-el that who's escaped some dark realm of the Shadowfell, who's, who's sort of been, you know, kind of like pushed out into the world by your parents, or, right? And then if you come to our, our, you know, whatever plane that the campaign takes place on, that like that they have some power because they're an right. alien in that in that plane. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, that, that's some, some fascinating ideas. You could totally play with that. Yeah, I like that too, and I like also just you know the straight up kind of. You know, story of like, oh, you know, someone's been abducted and taken into the shadow film. We have to go into them to rescue them. Yeah, you know, like that is got some really great hooks on it, especially if there's an NPC or a a, 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 a yeah, player character that ha- yeah, people uh, are attached to. You know, what better motivation is there? Right, and there's um, there's also the idea of uh, the revenant. I think that was in Volo's guide, mm-hmm. and um, you know, they're uh, an undead who's sort of trapped by a sense of revenge. And so there's unfinished business there. There's some sort of tragedy, you know, that's you know, something that you could loop into the Shadowfell and yeah. kind of build a story off of. Uh, and so far as, like... Are the, are the undead, like, basically shadow creatures? Is there is there a distinction between regular undead and shadow undead? Yeah, I mean, the undead have... Um, a, they're more sort of... Hmm, whoosh. Sorry, big guns, question. lots of guns, Lorf. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, what do I talk about? What do I talk about? <laughs> so, so there's different undead, and they have different um, sort of resources of power, essentially. But most undead are more associated with the negative energy plane, right? Uh, but there are undead associated with the Shadowfell more so than other places, and certainly there are undead in the Shadowfell, and and so on. But there are also plenty of living creatures in the Shadowfell, mm-hmm. like shadow mastiffs and stuff like that. Um, a Yeth Hounds, I think, maybe are from the Shadow Fell. I'd have to double check that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, there, uh, you know, so th- there are other living things there. It's not like the in Stranger Things where, like, there's strange fungal monsters and alien stuff like that. Right. Um, that's more, I guess, in Dini, that would be more like the Far Realm. Uh, but yes, uh, right. You know, the the sort of sense that. Um, when you go there, you're sort of infected with this uh, unease and dread, and you know you can become trapped in your own thoughts, and you you can kind of you know if you if you stay in the shadowfell too long, you might sort of play out tragedies of your own past, you know, mm. in, in your thoughts and deeds and stuff like that. So it's a it's a it's a dark place, and it is definitely like ripe with fantasy horror tropes. Like you're you're like you know you you you. If you're gonna play something that is the, into that horror kind of, you know, or more suspenseful type of campaign, there's so much to draw on with the Shadowfell. I mean, that, that it would have, you know, I mean, I don't know, it's dreams a part of it, or like like negative dreams yeah. or scary dreams a part of it. And it's it's like um, the, the way I think of it is that it's less. Uh, it, it, there isn't necessarily a direct analog of everything in the world, so it's a mirror realm, but it's sort of this nightmare plane. So. You know, if you went to the Shadowfell, like, and somehow transported to the Shadowfell directly from someplace in Waterdeep, yeah. would you encounter a Shadowfell version of Waterdeep? Maybe. Mm-hmm. Maybe there's just, like, that one tavern that, that has that some... That you recognize. That you recognize, that you have some connection with, and that has some meaningful, you know, nature to you. Um, you know, if you, it, like, so it's... Obviously, in in sort of fourth edition, it was just direct analog, and 
Um, there were some places in particular that had whole shadow realms, but then there are other places in 4th edition and I think in 5th now that we imagine that are entirely new realms. And so if you sort of have mapped directly over, you know, the mountain is just gone because there's this other location there or there's a city that isn't a city in the normal world and stuff like that. And so it's not directly analogous. Interesting. <clears throat> All right, cool. Um, anything else uh, for folks who are thinking about the Shadowfell and Stranger Things uh, as we wrap this up? Yeah, I, I mean, I think just, you know, go wild with it. Um, you know, if your players are up for it, uh, try and build a, a cool um, tragic hook with them, you know, and, and make it happen. So Yeah. Right, that makes it. I'm sorry, I was blocking some of the sound that was coming <laughs> from other places. I don't think it was actually going to do anything. Uh, yeah, no, I, like I said, there's lots of ways to to be inspired uh, by Stranger Things and Dungeons and Dragons and the Shadowfell all together. So I'd be curious to see if people have got uh, maybe something up on Dungeon Master Skill that kind of combines some of these uh, these ideas together. Yeah, yeah. And, and if you're you know playing with the Shadowfell with your players and stuff like that, I definitely would encourage, um, you know, trying to build that tragic relationship, tra tragic story with the player. Mm -hmm. um, because that aha moment in the campaign is going to be a lot more fun if um, you aren't springing on them all of a sudden, like, and it's your twin sister. <laughs> 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 you know? She's been trapped in the shadow of this whole time, and am I blowing your mind? And you're like, no, no. what? I don't know. <laughs> but right, if it was yeah. their idea, they're like, yeah. oh, I have this twin sister. You know, like, yeah. I don't know, that, yeah, that's a good point, for sure. That's true of any storytelling, but definitely yeah. for something like this. Uh, yeah, cool. Uh, all right, cool. Well, if people want to give you uh, uh, some some more ideas and or ask you more questions about the Shadowfell, how can they get in touch with you? I'm at Cernet on Twitter, S-E-R-N-E-T-T. -T. Cool. Uh, I am at Greg Tito. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we'll be back with you with some more lore coming up soon. Sweet. What do you guys think about all that? Did you want to go to the waterfall? The waterfell? <laughs> Don't go chasing waterfalls. Oh, uh, Cy Rock Omega, you are a man uh, after my own heart. Thank you. Shadow Deep, someone else, he also said. Shadow Deep. Yeah. Shadow Deep. They do like to call things by their names in Waterdeep. Undermountain, Waterdeep. Like, <laughs> just right on the nose. Never winter. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, all right. The Yawning Portal. Me and my other trend. All right, so we're uh, going to do our last segment of the day, recording session-wise. Uh, stick around afterwards. We're going to get to Force Gray, Lost City of Omu. We have episode 14 today. Is that right? Pelham, 14? 13. 13. The lucky number 13. See, I was already going to the next one uh, for a little bit of a while back. It's been the lucky number. But it's a long episode. I believe it is uh, uh, 50. No, how long is it? 37 minutes. 37 minutes. I'm just going to keep saying things and then ask if it's true or not. And that's good content, right? <laughs> uh, so it's a longer episode. Stick around for all that. It is really good stuff. Uh, and oh, I missed the opportunity to name drop Shadow Sorcerer. What's the Shadow Sorcerer? Uh, well, there are a number of different classes and prestige classes. Uh, that were shadowy. Yeah, shadow something or other. So I, that's probably one of them. Probably one of them. All right, that makes sense. Sorry, not Jess. Oh, or, that's a good point. Well, or maybe just the, is there a shadow sorcerer associated on like Honor Arcana? I don't think there was one in the player's handbook. Oh, I don't know. Is there one coming out for Xanathar's? I don't know. I don't think I've seen that yet. I don't know. But you see, we like to be surprised by things too. I always kept on thinking of the shadow dragons and like all the that whole, yeah. you know, yeah. bit where they come from. The shadow eggs. <laughs> I only lay shadow eggs, and then they turn into shadow chickens. It's a, it's a void chicken slash void egg reference for you Stardew Valley players out there. Uh, all right, so we're going to go do our next uh, segment. Sound like a plan? Yep. All right. It is from the Xanathars. Thank you, Nachez, for telling us about our own products. No, You're a good go. person. You're a good person. Uh, and, yes, it is going to be cool stuff. Uh, all right. You ready? All right. Welcome to another segment of Lore You Should Know, where we get into Dungeons and Dragons lore from the Forgotten Realms, or in general, and uh, tell you all about it so that you can use it in your game or just for your edutainment, as I like to call it. Uh, I am joined by uh, Mr. Matt Cernet. Hello. I am Greg Tito. I forgot to mention that part, but that's less important. Nobody cares about me. Uh, more importantly, today we're going to talk about lycanthropes. Oh. Werewolves, <laughs> were tigers, yes. were bears, were bats. Were lots of things. Where's my car? Yeah. 
So uh, where creatures, like canthropes, go all the way back. All the way back. All the way back to chain mail. They were in chain mail? They were in chain mail. No. So you could get uh, one of your army units could be a werebear or a werewolf, and it would bring animals along with it of its type. And that could that was one of your army units in chain oh. mail. So they, they go way back to so the very origins of the For those game. of you who don't know, chain mail was the uh, war game that was designed by Gary Gygax as the precursor to designing Dungeons and Dragons with Dave Arneson. Yep. Uh, so it was born out of those old war gaming things, but it had a lot of fantasy tropes in it. Uh, and uh, that's interesting. Yeah. You could have a were bear. Were bear and werewolf. Yep. And and so then in uh, the first edition Mo- Monster Manual, the the sort of pantheon is expanded to were boar, were rat, and were tiger. All of those are present. In the first monster manual, where tigers were in the yep. first monster manual. Yep, they're right there. Interesting. And so the funny thing is that there is, uh, let's see, it's, it's a dragon article. It's like Dragon 14, like issue 14. Number 14. Yeah. And uh, it's about sort of lycanthropes and how to handle them in the game and the rules for using them and so on and so forth. And it's written in this very convoluted fashions. Um, but the there's a funny thing where it says uh, that... You know, hey, other wear types. Other cultures have wear eagles, sharks, uh, <laughs> wear hyenas. Uh, fairy tales have skin changing swans and seals. Horror movies have produced wear apes and even wear snakes. And then it mentions Anthony, uh, let's see, it's Boucher's uh, The Complete Werewolf, uh, mentioned a man who was a wear dinosaur. Okay. Wear dinosaur. So I think, with the exception of the wear eagle, all those things are already <laughs> dainty at some point. <laughs> like, this article basically said, you know, you probably shouldn't do this, because the, the last sentence of the paragraph is, obviously this would rapidly get out of hand if not rigidly controlled. It rapidly got out of hand. It, it escalated quickly. <laughs> yes. It really did. So uh, second edition has uh, where apes, gorillas, is, uh, it has where dragons, it has where rats and snakes and... Uh, it has um, where badgers, where moles, where moles, where moles. Uh, he was like, man, I want to fight a mole. <laughs> That's also a dude. <laughs> and uh, yeah, like where where ravens, of course. Uh, and yeah, it, it got basically like where something. And there was an, an interesting. Uh, there's a set of um, Ravenloft uh, products that deal with where beasts. Um, and uh, one of them is sort of Van Richten, who's the sort of Van Helsing version in Ravenloft. Yeah. Uh, he has a series of Van Richten's guides, too. And one of them is, is like Canthropes. And he talks about um, the different versions that he's heard of and that he's seen. And his strict rule is it's got to at least be some sort of predator slash carnivore omnivore like there's no just straight up plant eaters mm. so we don't see wear any, horses wear horses wear hippos you know wear things, giraffes wear giraffes <laughs> they're so cute and i looked for, for such things and i could not find any wear hippos or wear horses or wear giraffes. At least stat it up in yeah, an official yeah. Dungeons so, and Dragons. Yeah, that might be legit. It might be the case that there are no herbivores, strict herbivores, who are who are wear anything. That's a good rule of thumb. Yeah. But still, there should be more restrictions on it. <laughs> um, are they all treated as diseases? Are they all treated as, like, this is a, a disease that you get? E- yeah, it, it is sort of, I mean, there's... There's some things that are a little different. There's there's things that are jackal wares that have a sort of different origin story. And there's there's sea wolves, and sea wolves are um, they're basically wolf sharks uh, that also give you lycanthropy and turn you into a wolf shark. Um, <laughs> but but not a man. Like there, there's no there's no human part of that. You can be you. Can, I th- there might be a hybrid there. I'm, th- there's often. Like, there's often the, the hybrid and the animal and the full human form. Yeah. And with things like uh, sea wolves, and there's another one that's escaping me at the moment, uh, you, there would be the the animal form was sometimes a full-on animal form. So maybe you would just go full shark. Full or, shark. You know, and then you were a wolf. Uh, no, then you were a sea wolf. Then you were a weird wolf shark what person. What is a sea wolf? It's, it's, a, it's a, like, like an, an otter? It, it looks like a shark with a wolf's head. And uh, I think it might have forearms. Um, 
and yeah, that's like the, the doggy paddle yeah, <laughs> with like a shark tail. Yeah, it's a shark tail. Yeah. Oh my god. Uh, that which brings to mind the sea lion, which doesn't isn't a lycanthrope. There's so there's sea wolf and the sea lion. The sea wolf is a lycanthrope. The sea lion's just a, a lion body on the attached to a. Oh, body. which is different than the actual sea lion, right? Which is species, uh, which is just like a big seal, yeah, right, so, or a walrus type. Thing. Yeah, there it, are there are apparently where walruses. That's in Van, Van Richten's guide. I I haven't found a stat block for that today when I was looking, but he mentions that there are were walruses. He says he says that he's heard of them or, or encountered them. Right it's like way. tusk. It's, it's, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's interesting that this is a trope in folklore. That I mean, this is kind of like the D and D motif, right? Where like they take something that's kind of like a story that we've seen in in in, in uh, fairy tales and movies and things like that, and then just blow it up to yeah. you know three hundred percent. Yeah, and and just takes that ball and just keeps on running, like just off the field and just keeps on going, right. and going, and going. But <laughs> what, at the core of it is this idea that you're you're cursed with some kind of disease. It's not a curse. You 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 have a disease. It's yeah. usually from the bite of yeah. one of those creatures. It, it, it is it is a curse and a disease. It's sort of both. Um, it's called the curse of lycanthropy. It's treated as a disease in various editions of the game based on the rules. Um, and it does the, the the fundamentals are usually the same, which is that uh, there are infected versions that can um, that bite you and don't have control over their uh, transformation. They just transform whenever there's a full moon. Yeah. And then there are um, born versions that are that are like a you know that have like an infected one um, gives birth to or fathers a a child, and that is now a born version of that lycanthrope or whatever. It's not, it's not infected anymore. Does so. a curse get passed down? Yeah. Or and, is it, is it like a, and, like and an actual... It's, it's like just natural in the blood. And, th- and those, those individuals can control their transformations and when they transform and stuff like that. Oh, okay. So that's the distinction is if you were, if you were a born lycanthrope, then yeah. you, you have more free will. Yep, and you have more power over what I mean. You know, they, they, there's always toying with the idea that the characters that um, even born like Anthropus have to transform during the full moon and stuff like that. But in general, the idea is you have control over when you transform, and thus you can kind of wolf out or bore out or, <laughs> or rat <laughs> dragon out. out, as the case may be. So, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about the were dragon in a second because that seems <laughs> totally broken. Yeah, it is. Um, but yeah, I, I like the idea of where rats and things that are, you know, that would normally not be something you would dramatize in a D&D campaign, but then all of a sudden you're bringing this like, oh, this idea of the, the characteristics of an animal uh, uh, in a, amongst a community of, you know, so like the Were Rat Thieves Guild, for example, yeah. is one that's kind of mm-hmm. been built up a lot as like, oh, this is a trope in, in Forgotten Realms and all D&D lore. Yep. You know, I think that's kind of interesting. Like, it's got this whole other storyline to it. But as soon as you go into the crazy things like, you know, where dragons, then it's like, I don't, I, it, it, wears, it falls apart for me. Where snakes. Where snakes? Yeah. I mean, you already cats. have the Yuan Ti. And... Yeah, there are actually cats, jaguars, and panthers, and tigers. And tigers and bears. I don't think it's a wear cougar, so we're safe. But <laughs> don't give them any ideas. Um, so, but there are also like full societies of where like like anthropy is is integrated within it. Yeah, there, well, in different different parts of different settings, um, things like that have popped up. So obviously, the the were rats are are a thing. Um, there's oftentimes an idea of communities of werewolves. The Forgotten Realms has a, has uh, a couple um, prominent communities of werewolves. Um, there's one down in what's called the Wood of Sharp Teeth, um, and or the Werewoods, or something like that. Uh, a bit on the nose. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and that's um, sort of uh, near Baldur's Gate and so on. And that's um, that has a, a community of lycanthropes that um, stem from a, a ruler of Baldur's Gate who was a werewolf and was kicked out and went down there and with a like, I'm setting up my own shop. Right, um, and then you mentioned the Moonshay Isles also has. Uh, yeah, there's a there's a whole island kind of that has a bunch of uh, lycanthropes, mostly werewolves, on it um, that are sort of Molar worshippers, and then there's uh, also the Grey Wolf tribe of the Uthgard, who are um, mostly natural lycanthropes, uh, and some some sort of um, infected versions of them. Um, so the natural is the one that w- was born. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah, and, and so you know, um, the it, there's all kinds of different reasons to play with it, the the um, different types of lycanthropes in that way. I mean, there there are also places where there are communities of where tigers. 
you don't really see communities where bears because bears are thought of as more solitary and so they mm. tend to, and it's more sort of on the model of um the character in lord of the rings whose name escaped me at the moment um, bjorn yeah bjorn it's it, they're sort of modeled after bjorn and so they're kind of just off on their own, you know, gruff own thing. yeah and they're, they're generally good guys and stuff like that i like honey and mead and oh. um and I think they're, they're mead. They're mead brewers. Yeah, that makes well, sense. Yeah. Duh. Uh, <laughs> wear ravens that are generally depicted as good. Um, and wait, wear ravens or generally? Ravens, why yeah. are they depicted as good? I don't know. They just are. I feel like ravens are much more of like a negative, like oh. you know, trope in like everything. Yeah, they're, they're good guys. They're, they're the good guys. Really, yeah, I've never heard that before. I, yeah, it's a thing. Huh? Yeah. Are they because they can fly? They can pass? They can travel a lot? Interesting. Yeah, somebody just like ravens, I think. Oh, <laughs> yeah, right. Somebody in the annals of uh, D&D history was like, yeah, they're cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they, they clearly don't work in this office because the, <laughs> the ravens after work on a fall day yeah, just are terrifying. Constantly, kar, kar, kar. It's yeah. like, where did I end up in the birds? Um, that's uh, So where tigers are usually associated with, like, jungles and things, too, is that correct? Yeah, of course, because, I mean, the tiger... It's a natural habitat yeah. of where they are. I mean... Obviously, not all tigers live in the jungle. A lot of them, you know, in, in China and stuff like that are in alpine environments and so on. So, mm. like, it's kind of weird that we associate them in, in D&D with just with jungles. But, um, you know, there's kind of that a typical of the 80s, uh, you know, lions, tigers, elephants, giraffes. All these things live in a jungle, right? Of course. Right. And it's like, no, actually, <laughs> biodiversity, they do different things, whatever. But yeah. Um, <clears throat> but they get associated with that uh, yeah. as, as being a part of their their, their shtick. Uh, yeah. So what if you were going to make a, a, a campaign or, or, or set it somewhere in those places you located in the Forgotten Realms, like what's what's the tenant of, of those those stories uh, about lycanthropes. Oh, so um, my are they trying to get healed? Are they the in my mind um, the the moon chase, for example, is yeah, have you seen a uh, Thirteenth Warrior? Uh, I'm aware of it. Yeah, yeah. I have never actually seen okay. it. I know. Get on. I know. It's on the list. Oh, it's so good. It's like a D&D movie, but without magic. Um, and Antonio Banderas. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. Uh, so uh, the. Uh, the sort of bad guys in that I think of is uh, very much like the the werefolk on um, the one island of the moon chase. Uh, they they are not friendly with outsiders and they're going to eat you. Mm. Um, and they're pretty savage and so on and so forth. Um, the Uthgart are um, more civilized in the sense that they um, you know can are more capable, I guess, of talking and walking and so on. But um, they have l- long had that um, sort of built into their society that they're like anthropes and so on. So they're also just behaving as wolf packs and so on. And um, and they are inclined to uh, not let anyone live. So they don't like to actually infect people. So the, if you encounter the, the Uthgart, Grey Wolf Uthgart, they're, they're inclined to just kill you dead if they have a fight with you. Um, or not, you know, not bite you because they can just stab you with things. Uh, so, and you know. is it because they, they they find it sacred? They don't yes. want they don't yeah. want other. They don't want to sort of pass on the gift of Uthgar, their sort of god, um, ultimate god, and, mm. and their their totem, which is the wolf. And so they don't want to pass on that gift um, to others right. uh, who are unworthy of it. So they go and they if they in, accidentally infect someone, they try and hunt them down and kill them. So that's their their shtick. And there's also the the the, the trope or the story about you know uh, someone unwittingly getting infected and then you mm-hmm. know and they can be a very powerful figure, a king or a queen yes. or a, a, a emperor. You know, and then having to hide that. I mean, you, you alluded to that a little bit with the Baldur's Gate story. And that's like, that's basically the Baldur's Gate story. Uh, he was a um, a noble who would, um, I think it was Baldur's Gate. It might have been Dag. I think it was Baldur's Gate. Anyways, he was a, he was a noble that uh, would basically plan hunting trips during certain times of year, and oh. then you know the, the full moon, and he would go off and, and hide at his hunting lodge out in the woods, mm-hmm. and um, and then. Uh, Am I getting two things confused? That might be two different things. There might be a, there might be a werewolf family that did that from Waterdeep, and then one from Baldur's Gate that went down and uh, and had because he did the one from Baldur's Gate actually tried to do a rebellion and take over the town and infect everybody with lycanthropy. Well, and just take over, but it failed, and then he had to run away. Ah, oh, there's too many werewolves. Um, so what, what you're getting at is that there's lots of ways, yeah, to, integrate lots of ways it to do within it, your definitely. story, right? Yeah. 
And, you know, one of the things that, you know, in thinking about um, where rats that I think is really fun is that you, we think of them as thieves and stuff like that. Uh, you know, like maybe they don't like silver. So, like, the, one of the, the hints that your players can get that they've happened into where rats is that these all these robberies happen, but they leave behind the silver. Right. Because right? that's the bad stuff they don't want to touch, you know. Or maybe they don't t- like it, so they pick it up and they huck it in the river or something like that. And so the, people are finding silver all over the place in random weird places. Well, that's a cool you idea. Know? And and it turns out it's because where rats are the ones who are doing this, this stealing of the stuff, and they're they're disposing of the silver someplace where right. you know they think it won't be found. There's ways to to, yeah. to drop little hints of what's happening. Now, is all of them are affected by the the moon? All the wares. Yes, yeah. I mean, certainly now in 5th edition where we have a more limited group of were-creatures. It's basically the ones from the um, the uh, Monster Manual, and I th- think were-ravens might have snuck into Ravenloft, but I'm not positive at this point. Okay. Um, and that's that's uh, that's the, the sort of main list. So Neat. I, I doubt we'll get into, you know, wear anything else at this point. I mean, jackal wares are still a thing there in the monster manual or Volo's got their monster manual. Yeah. Um, but, like, I doubt we'll get to wear snakes or, <laughs> you know, wear dragons anytime soon. Well, especially when, when you have creatures that already fill that niche yeah. anyway, yeah. you know. I mean, Yonti and we have Rakshasa and, you know, we have all kinds of creatures that already, you know, occupy sort of that shape and look and, you know, yeah. and so on. But like, there is that idea of there being like a tragedy or like one that has been bitten or cursed and having to save them or, or, right. or embrace it. Like, I like that idea right. too. They're like, oh, you know, this is your curse. This is your people. You know, so integrating it and being like, all right, I, this is who I am. You know, I like that as well. Yeah. I think the, the one thing is that's weird is where bears has always been a bit weird in D&D because they're good and it, your transformation actually makes you more powerful. So, like, it's always been a bit of a struggle to explain why they, like, why isn't there the kingdom of were bears? Right. <laughs> <You know>? right. <laughs> why isn't there, like, all these natural were bears? And I think we, we kind of get around that by um, the, just with the idea that they're so solitary. Right. Mm. And so they, they don't. They don't form groups. They don't form groups. They don't, you know, do all that kind of stuff because yeah. they're, they're just naturally sort of solitary. So, yeah, I like that too. So you can encounter that as a good random encounter in a wood is to 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 meet with a a good inclined were creature and uh, find out about yeah. what makes that tick or being a good NPC or a quest giver that kind of thing. Yeah, and there's certainly that you know you can definitely have the idea that um, even with uh, if there if even with like the full moon and a an infected lycanthrop, even if they're supposed to be good. They they still might have a sense of bloodlust or you know the need to feed and you know and that's so it's probably not a great idea to hang out at the werebear's house when he's hungry when there's know? a full moon yeah. happening <laughs> it's right. pretty, you know let's get out of here yeah. let's find someplace else to stay I mean that is I mean do do they there are some of them that lose control during those times during their transportation yeah definitely I think that that's a story that people can play with because it's it's too much fun not to I mean if they're just somebody who has superpowers because and they can turn into a weird werebear person that's a little bit less right. interesting then but if there's some some drawback it yeah. actually makes it more interesting and yeah. more compelling. Yeah, so concentrate on that. Um, wait, Greg, ask about the bitter dew. What's the bitter dew? The bitter dew is not a were creature or a lycanthrope. The bitter dew. Uh, oh no 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 no! I'm thinking of the umblebee. Sorry, that's different. Umblebee. Umblebee is different. The bitter dews um, are a set of werewolves that are associated with um, uh, some Bob Salvatore novels uh, and this town of Longsaddle. Ah. So um, the Harples is a set of wizards that live outside the town of Longsaddle. Yeah. And Longsaddle, it's called Longsaddle, uh, they're into horses a lot there. Uh, it's sort of like a little, it's like a little mini Wild West setting. Mm-hmm. Um, and the wizards are like the sheriffs in town, if mm-hmm. you kind of put it that way, right? Yeah. Because uh, they, they are the only sort of real force of law, and they're, they're sort of this powerful family of wizards. Well, uh, the Harples were this powerful family of wizards uh, until a bunch of them somehow got infected with lycanthropy and ended up running around in the woods. And so there, there are the bitter dews, which are the what what are the called these werewolves that live out in the woods that are associated with the Harples, and they are still sort of good. Um, and they're still sort of part of the family, so... Are they still sort of wizards, too? Uh, I, unclear. Unclear. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and that stems from, from characters in Bob's novels and sort of how that sort of evolved after Dritz was absent for a long period. He came, and, and Caterbury and so on. So Caterbury comes back, um, and 
learns about the bitter dews and not to be, be, be to be beware of them and stuff like that. And then she ends up interacting with some of the, the remaining harples in the house and that kind of thing. So. Got it. Okay, cool. That makes uh, sense. Umble bees aren't like anthropes, and they they don't. Yeah, I was thinking of the umble bee because it's such a ridiculous name, like the bitter dew. <laughs> and umble bees are giant, um, fuzzy, bigfoot-like creatures that attack you with static electricity. Oh, okay. So not lycanthropes at all. No. All right. Phew. That yeah. was close. Uh, but now I'm thinking of where bees. <laughs> There's no insects, as far as I can tell, uh, uh, in the lycanthropes. But uh, they kind of have to be warm-blooded. I feel yeah. like it's part of the part of the definition. I, I, I have a, a vague feeling that there might be some sort of like were wasp or something like that. But I, I'm not sure. I don't. I think we're probably safe. I think okay. we're safe from the were bees. Yeah, I was gonna say warm-blooded, but there are there are the the snakes, lizards, snakes, snakes yeah. and things out there too. Yeah. So that's not necessarily a mammal. Yeah, but that, that I seem to think that if you got you know well yeah. whatever. All the ones that we now currently have in the Monster Manual are all <laughs> were mammals, right? Yes. Okay. That's where we're sticking to. <laughs> all right. That makes perfect sense. For that book. Yeah. There must be restrictions, as that uh, <laughs> dragon number 14 told us. Yep. All right. Uh, where can people ask you questions, uh, Mr. Matt Cernet? On Twitter, at Cernet, S-E-R-N-E-T-T. I love it. All right. Cool. I'm at Greg Tito. Ask me anything you like about uh, the full moon and whether I howl out it. Out it? In it? During it. Howl out. I will howl out during the full moon. Uh, you stay thirsty, my friends. <laughs> what? <laughs> Take two. <laughs> yeah. Can I do that outro again? All right. No, no you're good? No, you're good. You'll cut it at the right time. <laughs> we got to get to Force Gray, so that's why we're closing it out. Uh, thank you guys so much for paying attention and listening to our fun meanderings as we record Dragon Talk Live every Monday from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. Pacific time, getting ready for Force Gray, Lost City of Omu. Uh, for those of you who have not listened to this entire three hours, which is probably most of you, uh, we're having a special Force Gray, Lost City of Omu show in New York City November 18th, 3 p.m. Eastern Time. We'll be broadcasting it live on twitch.tv slash dnd right here. Uh, but if you're in the New York City area and you want to check out Joe Manganello, Deborah Ann Wall, Utkar Shambhadkar, and Dylan Sprouse, maybe some other special guests joining again, and of course Dungeon Master Matt Mercer in live and in person in Brooklyn, New York, you can do so very soon. Uh, stay tuned to at Wizards. Uh, underscore DND on Twitter and or on our Dungeons and Dragons webpage uh, at DungeonsandDragons.com uh, to get more information about how you can buy tickets. They will be coming out very soon this week, but I want to give you, loyal Forest Gray watchers, uh, the first chance uh, and the first announcement of that. So again, there will be called uh, Forest Gray Survive the Tomb, November 18th, 3 p.m. Eastern Time. Mark your calendars for that. More information will be coming out this week. But without further ado... The Force Gray, Lost City of Omu. Oh, should we run an ad? Is that lame? I'm not going to do that. But next week, next time, we should run an ad. Um, it's going to happen right now. Episode 13, 37 minutes long. It's so long. Enjoy. <laughs>